Hello and good evening. Welcome to the UK Forestry Webinar Series. I'm Billy Thomas, an Extension Forester here in the Department of Forestry. We're broadcasting live from the studio here at the UK Department of Forestry in Lexington. We're delighted to have you all with us. I'm going to be your presenter tonight. I'm going to be talking about caring for your woodland. Um, but before I do that, I do want to mention how we're going to be handling questions. Please use the chat pod in the upper left hand corner of your screen. There should be a little chat pod button you can click there and um, put questions in there. We will try to take questions throughout the webinar, so feel free to get those um, in there. I will also mention that we are recording this webinar. I'll be covering a lot of content, so you can check back on our website a little bit later, and we'll have this webinar up so you can go and find anything that you might have missed during the recording. So really, without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. I'm going to go ahead and pull that up now. All right. So caring for your woodland. This is certainly an important topic. We have a lot of woodland owners here in the state of Kentucky, and they provide many benefits to all of us. Um, so tonight's webinar is all about trying to help you get the most out of your woodland. I do have my contact information up there. Please feel free to contact me. If you are at a county extension office, that's a great way to get a hold of me as well. They know how to get a hold of me um, at any time, basically. So um, please um, take advantage of that and use your county extension agent. Um, it's an outstanding resource for you. You will notice that we do have a, a little acorn up there in the upper left-hand corner. And um, we're going to talk a lot about oaks tonight. Oaks are certainly a very important species here in Kentucky. Um, we have uh, more than 20 different species of oak trees here in Kentucky, and we're having some challenges really getting them to regenerate. So a lot of my talk will uh, mention oaks and um, be focused on that. But that's not to say that we don't have a lot of other important species, including the maple and uh, many others. So um, we'll talk about all of those as we go through. I want to give you a quick overview about what I'm going to try to cover tonight's webinar. I want to try to drive home the importance of Kentucky's woodlands. They certainly are important. I want to talk about stewardship plans, what they are, um, why you need one, where you can get it, when you should get it, and how to go about getting it. Then I want to cover a number of different common woodland management practices that are often done here in the woods in Kentucky. So you've got an understanding of what we're trying to accomplish with each of these practices. This will make it much easier um, for you when you're talking to your professional foresters that you're working with. And then I want to wrap up the webinar talking about a number of different organizations and resources that are available to assist woodland owners. I understand a lot that people don't recognize all of these organizations out there. I know when we do programs across the state, a common thing that people will tell me is, Billy, I had no idea there was so much help available. So if you don't get anything else out of tonight's webinar, I hope that you will get an understanding of where you can go to get some more assistance. Certainly, I wouldn't expect you to um, comprehend or grab every little thing we're going to talk about in, in depth, um, but that's okay. There are a lot of professionals and others out there that want to work with you to try to get Get the most out of your woodland ownership. So please uh, make sure that you take advantage of that. So when we think about the value of our woodlands and the impact they have on Kentucky, it is significant. And a lot of times you don't really hear much about that. Woods cover 48% of the land here in Kentucky. So nearly half of all the land in Kentucky is covered in woodlands. And I think one of the reasons we don't hear more about it is because we all kind of take it for granted. It's just always been there and we think it'll always be there. So we don't really worry about it too much. There's also a lot of individual and um, private ownerships out there. It's estimated there's 155,000 woodland ownerships. Now an ownership could be one individual, it could be a husband and a wife, or it could be an entire family or an estate or a trust. Um, the way the US Forest Service categorizes that is under ownership. So there's 155,000 of those that own 10 or more acres. There's also another, a number of different woodland owners that own less than that. So we have a lot of individuals that do own land in the state, and they provide a lot of benefits to all of us. There's also a lot of employment that's derived from our woodlands. More than 28,000 Kentuckians are directly employed in the wood industry. And because the woods are privately owned largely, it is you all that help supply the raw material for this huge industry. It was estimated at nearly $14 billion in this year alone. So it's really important um, from an economic standpoint as well as an environmental standpoint. 
Amongst those Kentuckians that are employed in the wood industry, it includes 2,700 master loggers. That's a lot of individuals. A lot of those are small operations, um, maybe a family operation with just a few employees and probably have a few of you all in the audience. So thank you all for all that you all do. Um, without master loggers, it would be nearly impossible for our woodland owners to get their product to market. So they do an important service and they're an important link in the whole supply chain of forestry. Looking at the number of wood industries in the state, we estimate there's over 720 wood industries here in Kentucky. These range from very large operations that may employ several hundred people to small cabinet shops or even smaller than that, just individual one or two man operations. So um, a, a lot of diversity we have here. And again, it's the woodlands that support all of this. Of all the wood that's harvested in Kentucky, 86% of it stays in the state and is processed here in the state. Wildlife, recreation, and tourism are all really important and are all really dependent on our woodlands. The tourism industry in Kentucky generates roughly $13 billion a year, and I would argue that without our woodlands and all the benefits that they provide as far as a backdrop for a lot of recreational opportunities, that would not be near as big. And certainly it's a sense of heritage. Um, most of our family farms have been passed down from generation to generation. So we have a lot of heritage and it's just a, a big part of who we are as well. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the threats that are facing our woodlands. There really used to be a time when you could just kind of let your woods grow and there would be no, really no big um, repercussions from doing that. It was kind of the doing nothing strategy. Um, but anymore, we have so many things that are facing um, our woodlands as far as threats that doing nothing is not a good option. One thing that's new or relatively new is invasive plants and insects and diseases. The global trade that we now have has facilitated the movement of not only um, PlayStations from Japan, but also emerald ash borer and other things from China that are devastating our woods. Uh, mentioned the emerald ash borer, it is moving throughout Kentucky and has basically been found in most counties in Kentucky. So that's an example of a species that came in, wasn't from here, and is having devastating impact. So just ignoring that is only going to create more problem. So whenever we're dealing with these invasive plants or insects, we want to treat them as quickly as we can. This past fire season was a bad one, but it's certainly not been the worst one we had, and it certainly wasn't as bad as what they had in Tennessee and the Gatlinburg area. The fire is a constant problem here in Kentucky. We have it in the fall and in the um, spring as well. So we have two fire seasons here. We just wrapped up our winter uh, or our fall fire season recently and um, it, it is a major problem. And one issue with fire we have here in Kentucky is a lot of our fires are ground fires. That means they don't necessarily get up into the canopy like a lot of the fires out in western United States. So the following year the trees will leaf out and everything will look green for the most part and people will think that there are no problems. But what's happened is those stems of the trees have been damaged and it's created um, openings for insects as well as diseases that really lower the value of the trees. So just because we have a fire that didn't kill all the trees doesn't mean there wasn't damage. So fire is a constant threat and, and good management, good fire breaks in your woodlands and knowing um, your boundaries and your neighbors and all of that are all important um, to keep that from being a bigger issue. Another concern we have here, when while it's not extremely widespread, it does happen, is timber theft and trespass. Um, while this is a small issue, it doesn't feel small if it happens to you. It feels like a really big deal, and it really is. Um, so managing our woodlands, working with professionals, having good relationships with our neighbors, all of those things can help ensure that timber theft and trespass is not a big issue. There is a law in the books that says if you're having a commercial timber harvest that you need to notify adjoining neighbors so that you wouldn't be liable for triple damages. Absentee woodland owners, unfortunately, are at extreme risk for timber theft and trespass. If there's nobody on the ground and nobody paying attention, um, it can lead to some problems. So all of these reasons really make doing something with our woodlands way more important than it used to be a number of years ago. The focus of what we do here at the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry is sustainable woodland management. We want to create healthy, 
and productive woodlands that are capable of supplying the needs of today's generation without compromising the ability of future generations to have opportunities to manage these woodlands as well. So everything that you'll hear coming from us or the Kentucky Division of Forestry that works closely with woodland owners is about sustainable woodland management. We're in this for the long term. And uh, just because you harvest a, a stand of trees doesn't mean it's not a forest. It's going to come back as a forest. We just want to do things the right way. And we will be talking a little bit about some timber harvests that we can use to manage our woods as well a little later on in this presentation. So why would you manage your woodlands? One reason that a lot of people are attracted to managing their woodlands is because there's value in the timber that's standing there. Um, we estimated a little over $1,000 on average in a lot of the acres here in Kentucky that were harvested um, just in the standing timber loan. And it won't go away, um, it'll just grow back in the future. There's also interest in a number of non-timber forest products out there, whether it be maple syrup. Um, Kentucky just partnered with Virginia this last weekend to host the first ever Kentucky Virginia Maple Syrup School. So this is an opportunity for landowners that have a lot of maple on their property to get some income without having to harvest timber. Another reason people manage their woodlands is because they care about the woodlands. They just want to have healthy woods. They want to have something for future generations to enjoy and, and pass it on to the next group. Wildlife is also a big issue here in the state. We have one of the best um, um, white-tailed um, buck, or excuse me, white-tailed deer herds here um, in the United States here in Kentucky. Um, we're well known for that, but we have a number of other game and non-game species, and a lot of landowners are interested in managing their woods to try to create better habitat for their wildlife. And we'll talk about how we can go about that a little bit later, as well as how you can work with private lands biologists from the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources that are available to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. Recreation is also another reason a lot of people like to manage their woods. And we can do things that make all of these things come together that can be compatible with one another. Another. The key is working with a professional that can help you make good decisions and implement good practices on the ground that will ensure that all of your objectives are being met. So that leads us why you need a woodland management plan. I argue that you need a woodland management plan because it represents a very important asset that's under your care. You're paying taxes for it um, and you're responsible for it, so you might as well find out what you have. It gives you an opportunity to make sure that you don't have any problems that need addressing. One of the big advantages of doing a woodland management plan is it gets you technical assistance. It kind of gets you in the know. It also gives you access to call share programs. Many of the farm bill programs that are available for woodland owners require that you have a stewardship plan in place. So you need to get that plan done um, before you can apply for many of these programs. So for no other reason alone, it just opens up opportunities for you to get um, some assistance, some financial assistance actually, to help you manage your woods. And what do you want to do with your property and understanding what it's capable of? The Woodland Management Plan will help you understand this. And ultimately, the ideal is that it can help you get your objectives achieved on your property. And hopefully, you'll have multiple objectives that can be achieved under this Woodland Management Plan. So those are some of the reasons why you need a Woodland Management Plan. Here in Kentucky, the primary woodland management plan we talk about is the Kentucky Forest Stewardship Plan, and that comes through the Kentucky Forest Stewardship Program. This is a program that's administered by the Kentucky Division of Forestry, and they have service foresters that can come out and work with you one-on-one -on, -one on your property. This plan can also help gain access for those private lands biologists that I mentioned a moment ago. So, if you haven't done one of these plans uh, and you're a woodland owner with more than 10 acres, I encourage you to do so. I will say that there is a 25 acre minimum to get the private lands biologist to work with you. Um, they have a little higher threshold, um, but foresters would probably come out even if you had less than 10 acres, um, but to be eligible to participate in the program, you do have to have 10 acres or more. So let's talk a little bit about you and your woodlands and some of the things you need to consider as you go about managing your woodlands. 
One important consideration is, do you live on the property? Certainly if you're an absentee landowner and you live many miles away, it will limit what you're able to do on a regular basis. It will make having good contact, good local contacts, um, very important for you. Another consideration is really what are your dreams for your woodlands? What do you want to get out of it? And then another important part of that is are they realistic? Um, we all have big dreams, but sometimes we have to come back to reality a little bit. And um, we need to make sure that our woodlands are really capable of, of fulfilling our dreams. If not, we may have to adjust them to something that is more realistic. And when you get a woodland management plan, it's really a merger of your dreams and what your woods are capable of and what you're capable of doing with them um, to try to merge those the best that can be done. Another important issue is, um, do you need money off of it right now? Sometimes that is an issue. A lot of times landowners first get engaged in managing their woodlands when they get approached about doing a timber harvest. We would certainly encourage you to start managing your property well before a timber harvest, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why that's extremely important. But if you do need money to kind of get engaged with the woodland for whatever reason, um, that's something that the woodland management plan can help kind of assess. Where is an area in your property that may be ready for a timber harvest? Or are there some other things, whether it be hunt leasing or non-timber forest products that you can try to use to get you some income to try to help manage your woodland. Additionally, what are you capable of doing? We all have different strengths and talents and abilities. Um, some things that are going to be prescribed to happen in your woodland, you may certainly be able to do it. Others, you may need to get some assistance. Um, one of the things about those programs that I mentioned before is they offset the cost of doing that. So you may not have to do it yourself. You may be able to access money to where you can pay somebody else to get that work done that's necessary to kind of achieve your objectives with your woodland. One thing that I would strongly encourage you to do is get your family involved with this. Woodlands are a long-term prospect. We are talking about trees that can live hundreds of years. That's certainly much longer than any of us are going to be around. So when we're managing these woods, we have to have an eye to the future. And one of the best ways to ensure that our management practices are utilized and the fruits of those are born is to ensure that the property is passed on to somebody that's going to care for it and follow in that management tradition. Had our grandparents been managing their woods much better, we would be in a much different situation than we are today. Dr. Jeff Stringer, one of our um, primary um, instructors here in the Department of Forestry for woodland owners and master loggers, estimates that our woods are worth about 25% of their um, potential value, largely because a lot of the practices that we've done in the past or not done has really degraded those value, the value of those woods. So think about what happens after you're after we're no longer there um, on your woodland. Is the family going to take care of it? Are they going to be able to extend and carry on your management tradition? Um, so the, getting them involved early is and get them engaged in the property, get them invested in the property is really the best way to ensure that that woodland's going to be an asset for your family and for the community really in the long term. So really in involve and work with your family members on the management of your woodland. So I want to talk briefly about some of the different non-timber products that are out there. And the important thing I want you to take away from this slide here is that there are a number of non-timber forest products that we can get where we don't have to necessarily harvest trees, um, but we can still do these practices and be compatible for long-term timber management. The nice thing about some of these non-timber forest products, including maple syrup and others, is that they can provide an annual income and they can be complementary to our existing practices. A number of different examples I have here on the screen. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, we have shiitake mushrooms. We have ginseng in the upper right-hand corner. There in the middle left is pawpaws. I don't know if anyone's ever tasted those. Um, kind of a cross between a banana and a mango. Um, a Hoosier banana, sometimes they're called. Um, on the right, we have ramps. This is a delicacy. Um, it's in, really closely related to leeks and the onions. Um, and then honeybees are, are also another. But there's other things that you can do that are non-timber, such as um, firewood, 
There's a lot of craft materials, grapevines, and other materials that can be harvested from the woods. Um, hunting leases is another thing that's been picking up some interest in the last few years. So there's just a number of different products that are out there in our woods that we may not think about that do have some value. And if they don't have cash value, then they can have personal value or family value as well. Um, spending some time in your woods and getting to know them will help you understand some of these opportunities. One thing I will mention about the shiitake mushrooms up there is that when we're doing management practices, it may require us to harvest, or not necessarily harvest, but remove some trees, and we can use some of those logs that we get from that those management practices to grow shiitake mushrooms. Um, so that's another kind of um, example of how it can be compatible. So I want to talk briefly about timber management concepts overall. Certainly um, managing our woods for timber is an important value that we get economically out of our woods. Um, and it, even if you do not plan to harvest timber off your property, uh, you can almost guarantee that at some point somebody's going to harvest timber off that property, um, whether it's your children or future owners. Here in Kentucky, nearly all of our woodlands have been harvested at least once, most of them two and three times. And many people find that hard to believe just because we're, there's still about half the state covered in forest land, um, but they have been harvested. And if you've ever let a field just grow up and not mow it, you know what I'm talking about. It will quickly revert to trees. So um, the harvesting does not mean that the woods are gone forever. It just means that they're at an earlier stage. So one of the things that we want to try to do when we are managing our woodlands um, and with an eye to timber at some point down the road is we want to maintain a high level of diversity, but we do also want to favor some of our historically valuable trees or trees that give us a number of different benefits. Um, oaks are certainly one of those um, categories of trees. We want to try to protect our woodlands from some of the threats I mentioned before, and that requires you being active on your property, at least semi-active, to know what's going on and um, ensuring that if there are any problems that you've got a hold of those before they get too large. And we want to pay attention to the future for us. So a lot of times what we're, when we're managing our woods, we're paying close attention to what's happening on the forest floor, what tree species are coming up, um, are we getting the right species mix that we're interested in for the future. So we want to do practices that will kind of help ensure that long term we have the species that we want in our woodlands. And here in Kentucky, it can be challenging. We have over a hundred different native tree species here, and it's not uncommon to have 30 or 40 different tree species on a given acre. So there are a lot of diversities out there, but understanding that diversity and working with it um, and, and knowing how they grow uh, with one another is important. And here in a minute, I'll show you a slide that talks a little bit about um, the different tolerances of these species as far as how much sunlight they need and, and what stage they need to be before we can ensure that they're going to be able to do okay after a timber harvest. So with that timber management concept kind of as a backdrop, what are some of the high quality timber tree attributes that we're looking for? This is a tree from Letcher County. This is in Lily Cornette Woods. Um, it's a giant white oak um, and it's kind of a big example of a, of a nice tree for sure. Um, but some of the attributes that we're looking for, is it the right species? And again, the species is dependent on what you're trying to accomplish with your woodlands. Um, one one great thing about oaks is that they're not only valuable from a timber standpoint, but they're also extremely important from a wildlife standpoint. So um, it's a good example of how they can be very compatible with one another. And when we're thinking about timber, you know, eventually these trees are going to be harvested and sawn into boards. So it's important that they be straight. Um, that way we can get more boards out of um, the area. If they've got a lot of crook or sweep or, you know, if they're kind of bent a little bit, it's going to be hard to get straight boards out of that so that's going to limit their value. Another important thing is clear bark and it's not that they're going to use the bark, it's that the clear bark is an indication that there's no defects underneath that are being hidden. So if we have um, nice clear bark, it gives the potential buyers the um, ideal or at least the hope that that tree is in pretty good shape beneath. I do know that a lot of times landowners probably have an inflated 
um, vision of what their trees are worth. But if you if your trees have these types of attributes, you can pretty much rest assured that they are going to be of a higher quality. Another thing we look for is the size. Um, there are certainly minimum sizes that we need to get certain products out of it. So in order to be eligible for some of those, you have to have the right size. Soundness is another, and we're talking about a lack of rot in the tree. Um, that's where fire and other things that kind of lead to that um, can really cause us a problem. So how do we get these desirable attributes? Well, it does require management. And um, if we certainly, if we want to speed the process up, we need to, it will require management. We need to keep injuries out of our woodlands. We need to control the density of the trees that are growing. And we need to control how much light's coming to the ground during the regeneration process. And we'll talk more about that here in a moment. I want to shift now to some of the common woodland management practices that are done and recommended to be done here in Kentucky. Um, these are based on a lot of experience, not only of myself, but of a number of different foresters in the region that have um, that prescribe these practices really on a daily basis. We'll talk about invasive species. Um, we mentioned those a little bit earlier, um, but we'll spend another moment about on those. Talk a few minutes about crop tree management and then mid-story removal. Now these first three are topics that we, uh, or excuse me, practices that we will do in the woods um, before we're going to do a timber harvest. The last three practices, the group selection, the shelter wood, and obviously timber harvest, are talking about regenerating the wood. That's a, when it's time to kind of get ready for the future for us. So we think of those, those first three as kind of intermediate treatments, and then the final is kind of regeneration treatment. So why are invasive plants bad? Um, hopefully this does not look like your house um, covered up in kudzu. Um, and certainly this is the vine that ate the south largely. And it is a big problem. It is a problem in eastern Kentucky and southeastern Kentucky and along the southern part of Kentucky. Um, but I've been noticing really on kind of a yearly basis, it seems to be creeping further and further north. Um, this is an example of a really bad infestation. The thing I want to draw your attention to is look what's coming up through that. Basically nothing. Um, it, it will smother out all regeneration of trees and other things eventually if left unattended. So when we get invasive species, we want to treat them early um, before they cause problems. And we want to treat them early because they really do negatively impact our ecosystem. And they do that in a number of ways. One, you can see there, they really certainly reduce the diversity of the different plants and animals that we'll call that home. Obviously, they're going to reduce the productivity if you don't have the right trees growing in the area. Um, they will remove habitat, not only for trees, but for wildlife as well. So all of these are really pretty negative things um, on our ecosystem when these invasive plants come in. So the big thing I, will, I hope you'll take away from invasive plants is we want to treat them early before they get bigger and cause a much bigger problem and are much more difficult to treat. So what can we control when we're managing our woods? Um, do you think we can control the soils or the moisture levels or really where the woods are at on the landscape or is it a ridge top forest or is it down in the bottom? Um, what about the species? Really probably amongst all of those, the species is the one that's the easiest for us to control. And we control the species composition. We can do it by planting other trees in there, um, but that's not really done that, mo that commonly. The way we try to control species is we control the sunlight. And I'm not talking about actually controlling the sunlight. I'm talking about controlling which trees get sunlight um, by, by practices that favor one tree or another, how much light they're getting. That's where we're going to be concentrating our growth. Um, those other things above, we really can't do a lot about, but we can, by management practices, control wh which trees are re getting the amount of sunlight that they need. All right, talk a little bit about crop tree management, crop tree release. Um, I would like to give it a quick acknowledgement to Dr. Jeff Stringer, mentioned him earlier. A number of these slides um, I borrowed from him, um, so thank you, Jeff, for those. Um, but this practice here I want to talk about is crop tree release. Um, looking at the picture I have here, um, the kind of lighter um, shaded trees are our crop trees, and then the, um, the skeletonized trees are our deadened trees, and then the other kind of dark trees are trees that we've left alone. The reason I really like this practice is that it can be done in a lot of different sizes of stands, whether you're dealing with very small um, trees or if you're dealing with larger trees. Um, 
the ideal behind this practice is that we're concentrating the growth on the few trees that we want um, to satisfy our objectives. Now, they don't always have to be timber trees. They could be other reasons that we select them as crop trees. It could be wildlife trees. It could be a big old hollow beach that we wanted to leave because it was a great wildlife tree. Um, it could be a maple because we wanted it for maple syrup or the beautiful fall colors. It could be a variety of reasons. And ideally, you know, it'll be trees that can do multiple objectives. The key to doing this is selecting trees that are healthy and that are likely to respond. So this is important when you work with a forester. They can help you identify which trees are likely to respond and be successful from this type of release. We want you to spend your effort the most efficiently in the woods that you can um, so that you can achieve your objectives as quickly and as cheaply as possible. And hopefully you'll select species that do fulfill multiple objectives. So when we're talking about crop tree management, think about the tree. This is an aerial view, if you would, over the tree. The green blob is our tree, and then the white blobs around it are the crowns of other trees. But we talk a lot about how many sides are we going to release. And so if we break the tree up into basically four quadrants, then we have four different sides, if you will, that we're thinking about. And this just makes it a little bit easier to uh, put the practice into place. So for some trees, we know that they will respond really well if we release all four sides. Other trees, we know we better only release two sides at any time and, and so forth. So certain trees have different requirements or, or not necessarily requirements, but they will respond better to different amounts released. So that's what we're talking about, uh, either one or a two or a three or four side release. So these are some examples of those different releases there in the upper left-hand corner. That's just a one-sided release. And then we walk our way around, um, two-sided release, a three-sided release, and a four-sided release. I will say, depending on your interest in managing these trees, you will choose different um, types of release. And again, different trees um, will respond a little differently. So your foresters can help you make those decisions. But again, we're, on, we're not worrying about trees that are not direct competitors with our crop trees. We only want to treat the trees that are competing um, with our crop trees. So the rest of them we don't have to worry about, with the minor exception if those other trees are invasive plants, um, then we want to go ahead and treat them because we don't want them to be a problem a little bit later on. So here's a side view of what this crop tree release management looks like. And ultimately, it's all geared about um, freeing the growing space. So notice that the trees that are underneath our crop tree, we're not necessarily worried about those. And we're not worried about those because they're not really competing with our crown to get more sunlight. So they're underneath that tree. So certainly there may be some species that um, when you remove some of the other competition that can later be a problem. Um, but again, your forester can kind of help make that decision. One thing I will mention about, you know, different sides for different, a different number of sides for different trees um, responding the best. Um, white oak we know is a tree that if you release all four sides on it completely, it will have a tendency to shoot out little branches off the side. And we call those epicormic branches. And it's great for the tree because it puts on more current but it's terrible for a wood quality perspective because it introduces knots into that wood and it can drastically lower the value of that tree. So from a timber standpoint, um, it is really not a good thing. Um, but just so knowing that can be an important thing. So keeping some shade on that main stem um, during these practices can ensure that that tree will not suffer from that or help to ensure that it's not likely to at least. Now, why do we recommend this practice? Well, for one thing, we know it works. There's been a number of studies, um, including some work that Dr. Stringer's done uh, um, at that Robinson Forest and other areas. So this chart right here shows you the 10-year diameter growth um, rate of some different species that are really common here in our neck of the woods. Um, and if you look at the kind of the yellow column there on the left, that's the unreleased growth rate. So that's how um, they, they grew when, when we didn't release them at all. And then we had some trees that we released um, there in the middle in the gold, and we saw how much it grew, grew there. And then in the far right, kind of the teal or green color there, um, we'll see kind of that percentage increased growth rate. And you'll notice that some trees really respond much better than others um, to that. 
Um, certainly, if we look at like the red oak and the white oak, they really responded quite favorably to this treatment. But overall, we were able to get a 50% increase in growth rates on these trees from doing this practice. So the crop tree management allows us to speed up the process quite a bit. So when do we need to do crop tree management? We need to do it if we're trying to alter the species composition. Um, certainly earlier in the stand, it gives us an opportunity to kind of pick which trees are going to be there for the long term. And that maturity, you will probably only end up with 30 to 50 crop trees per acre. So it's not an overwhelming thing to kind of manage. But when those stands are younger, there will be quite a few more crop trees as they're smaller. Um, we also want to do this if we're trying to save certain species. Suppose we don't have many um, white oaks in our stand or other species that we're really trying to favor. Um, we would want to do this management practice to try to ensure that they stick around. And we want to do it when we know that we can get good growth out of them. So I would recommend that you do crop tree management on some of your best ground. Um, and that's usually not a bad recommendation anyway to try to concentrate your efforts on your best growing area um, first and then move from there. The next practice I want to speak to is mid-story removal. And again, this is a practice that we've been doing a number of years here in Kentucky. Uh, many of our foresters out there are quite experienced and know how to implement this practice. But it's a practice where we're trying to favor oaks. What you may not be able to tell, but in the, right in front of us there in this picture is some red maple. Now, red maple is now the most numerous tree species in Kentucky of all tree species that is one inch and larger, so it is um, quite abundant. But what it's doing is it's starting to form some very thick mid-stories. So this is a mid-story that's really preventing a lot of our oaks and other trees from growing up in it. So this is a practice where we're going to try to treat that mid-story to favor the future crop of oaks. So here's a uh, kind of a pictorial example of it. On the left, we have um, a stand that has um, just covered up with red maple in the in the mid-story level. And then basically we come in and we remove all of that mid-story. And then that frees up a lot of sunlight for those seedlings on the ground there on the right picture. So think of it as an umbrella effect. So the umbrella, the higher it is up in the air, um, the least amount of shade it puts down on the ground. But as you pull that umbrella closer and closer to the ground, the darker it's going to get underneath it. So that's what we're seeing with these mid-story trees that are, you know, 15 to 20 feet up um, that are causing some problems as far as getting sunlight down on the ground. So looking at a side view of that, we'll start here, and this is just a little pictorial of what it looks like from the side. And then we want to come in, and we're basically going to remove all of that mid-story. Um, if you are familiar with the term basal area, it's basically the amount of growing space that the um, woods are being, the amount of the, <laughs> excuse me, the amount of the area that's being occupied by growing trees. Um, we're going to take out about 20% of that through that mid-story typically. Um, and then our once that um, regeneration gets up, um, you know, four to five feet in height, and we think it's going to be able to survive following a timber harvest, then we would come in and we would remove that overstory, either through a timber harvest or other practice that uh, frees them up so that they could grow. So again, this is a practice that we'll often use here in Kentucky to favor oak trees. Now I'm going to shift away from our intermediate treatments to talk more about regeneration treatments. Um, and a lot of times these do um, happen as timber harvest. One good thing about timber harvest for other than supplying income and supporting our wood industry is it's an opportunity to do some good management in your woodlands. It's a time when we've got a lot of activity. Um, we've got a lot of equipment in there that we can use that to our best benefit. But in doing so, we want to make sure that we're doing it right. We want to make sure that we are managing and harvesting our wood sustainably. So there's a few different timber harvests that I'd like to draw your attention to that we really do not recommend. Um, the first is high grading, and that's just where you take the very best trees and you leave the rest. And over time, what this does is this causes a number of problems that I'll talk more about, but basically it degrades the quality of the stand um, over the long term. And a lot of times, um, the selective harvest that people have, they say, well, I had a selective harvest. Well, really, that doesn't mean anything other than you didn't cut all the trees down. It doesn't mean that you, you were um, doing good management practices. It just means you didn't cut everything down. So sometimes our selective harvest can actually be high grades. 
Another management, or excuse me, timber harvest that we don't really recommend and on the surface is the diameter limit. Now, a diameter limit can be okay if we know a lot about what's going on in that stand and we know um, if, if everything's going the right way, then it can be okay. But what happens a lot of times is we'll have two trees that might be beside one another. And for whatever reason, they're the um, one tree was successful and the other one wasn't. They were the same age, but we're going to think that we're removing the larger tree to make room for the smaller tree. And actually, it's the same age as that older tree. It just didn't grow. And it's not going to be able to respond to that. So sometimes when we do these diameter limit harvests without um, having a forester in there, being able to assess um, the trees, if they will respond to that harvest, we don't really accomplish what we're hoping to do by kind of freeing up the um, smaller trees to grow. So that would be something that could be done, but I would only want to do it with a forester that was really familiar with the woods um, so before that would be recommended. So here's an example of a typical high grade from above. These blue dots represent our good trees, and you'll notice in this high grade here, we went and took out um, all the biggest um, blue dots that we had, and then all the red dots were our poor quality trees that may be poor quality from a species or a um, form standpoint. They may have other issues. Um, so there's some problems that happen with this. And again, um, one of the problems is damage um, in the, the these larger trees can cause problems to some of our smaller trees when they they are harvested. Um, but one of the bigger issues really is the shade that's um, created. What we're doing there is we're not creating big enough openings to allow some of our other species to regenerate. Um, certain species, as you'll see in here in a minute, need different amounts of sunlight. And uh, many of the ones that we want to favor um, do need a medium to large amount of sunlight. And then ultimately what we're doing is we're leaving a pretty poor quality stand for the long term. So thinking about um, regenerating our woods and regenerating the future forest. This is a publication that we partnered with some folks down at the University of Tennessee on and it is um, available off of our website but it's talking about kind of getting the woods ready for natural regeneration. One the reason I really like this publication is they've got this great table that shows you um, a lot of the almost all of the species we have in the region and it shows you how um, important different levels of um, development of these trees are for regeneration purposes. It also on the far right column shows you the shade tolerance. Now when we're talking about shade tolerance, it, it is what it sounds like. It's how tolerant those trees are of shade. So if we look at the very um, top species there, American basswood, um, it is tolerant of shade. Um, American um, beech, uh, on the other hand, is very tolerant of shade. So we'll notice that a lot of times we'll have American beech in the understory and pretty dark understories, and it can still hang out for a, a long time. And then the numbers there represent the higher the number, like number one means it's, um, that's a, really what you're looking for is advanced reproduction to try to get that regenerated. So this, this a table here, it covers most of the species. I will draw your attention to the one on the bottom, yellow poplar. So this is the state tree of Kentucky. It also happens to be the state tree of Tennessee and the state tree of Indiana, just to kind of show you how widespread and abundant it is. Um, but this is a tree that is extremely intolerant. So this is a tree that would respond really well to a, a full four-sided release that we talked a little bit about earlier. And again, so it's just a great reference to have, and you can get that off of our website. And when I wrap this webinar up, I'll show you where you can find some of these publications. Okay, so if we're going to do timber harvest, we always recommend that you plan well in advance of that timber harvest, that you work with a professional forester, you get an inventory to know what you have, what's ready for harvest, and that by working with the professional forester, you'll get a good understanding of that future forest, what what it, what you need to do to ensure that you're going to have a good stand that coming up. That may entail doing some pre-harvest work. The mid-story removal is an example of some pre-harvest work that we might do. So is the invasive species removal. We want to make sure that we got rid of the invasive species before we did a timber harvest, um, because when we open up the the floor to a lot of the forest floor to that sunlight um, those invasive species can really um, thrive so we want to prevent that from happening and we want to have a good plan in place for what we're going to do after the timber harvest to ensure objectives are being met 
And like I mentioned before, a timber harvest can really be an important management tool. So we want to make sure that we get the most out of that, not only as far as an economic standpoint, but that we're getting good management practice done on the ground. So working with um, good foresters and good loggers is the best way to kind of accomplish that. Some of the groups you'd want to work with when you're doing a timber harvest would be the Kentucky Division of Forestry and Consultant Foresters, and I'll talk more about those folks here in a minute. And I will mention quickly, though, that the Kentucky Division of Forestry has a good web page that talks about harvesting and selling your timber. It's got example contracts and some other information, um, example bids that you can use to try to help um, sell your timber. So again, we want to do management before the harvest. We've got an eye toward the future. And really, a lot of what happens after that harvest depends on what you did before. Did you set it up appropriate where you've got the right species as far as regeneration? Have you treated invasive plants like this tree of heaven being treated here by this gentleman? Um, so we want to make sure that we do things that are going to set that harvest up to be successful. And really, the best way I can recommend for you to do that is to work with a professional forester. The other thing I want to mention about caring for your woodlands is some of the best management practices. Now, these best management practices by law here in Kentucky have to be implemented on commercial timber harvest, um, and they're all designed about reducing or eliminating water pollution. There's not necessarily that um, we're talking about the sustainable harvesting practices, um, except for we're talking about taking care of water and keeping the soil in place. So again, we want to try to eliminate movement of soil and other and debris into the waters and our streams. Um, we want to try to control the amount of um, sunlight that's reaching the streams. We have a number of cold water streams here in Kentucky, and when we remove all the trees off of those streams, it really can change the water temperature and change the species that live in them. Um, we also want to make sure that we're not interrupting stream flow. Um, that can cause problems down the road for neighbors and, and people further down in the watershed. Um, certainly, we want to keep harmful substances such as diesel and other kind of chemicals and herbicides out of her water and these best management practices are practices that loggers and landowners can put on their property to ensure that they um, are protecting the water the best they can and I will say if you are a, a, um, a landowner you should get a ag water quality plan your county extension agent can do that um, you're supposed to have one of these plans in place if you're doing any um, practices whether that be farming or civil culture practices which are basically woodland management practices you're supposed to have one of these plans in place and again your county extension agent can help you walk through getting those plans it's not difficult um, doesn't take that long and they I'm sure they'd be more than happy to try to assist you in that process so who does these BMP inspections or best management practice inspections is the Kentucky Division of Forestry. They will inspect um, for water quality only. So they're only looking at water quality issues. They're not necessarily saying this was a good timber harvest or a bad timber harvest. They certainly can know that, but that's not what, what they're evaluating. They're evaluating the best management practices that have been put in on the timber harvest. Um, as far as which ones they inspect, they inspect all of those that they are aware of and any that get reported to them. I would recommend if you're going to have a timber harvest that you let them know um, so that you can get them out there and they can inspect it. It's also really important because if you if you have an issue, they come and inspect it and there's an issue and the logger's already left, then you've got to get the logger to come back with the equipment. And that could be hard, difficult and challenging for the logger. They may be in another job or another um, area, another county even, um, doing work there. So it can be a problematic. So it's just better to get that in inspected um, while they're there and before it's finished um, and then that way you'll your best to avoid any problems uh, so I would again re I recommend that you notify them before the harvest is over so that they can be ready to inspect it um, before that equipment leaves the site so that they can ensure that there's not any issues that are going to have to be addressed there is their contact information right there again if you're um, not certain on some of this stuff this webinar is going to be recorded so you can come back and check out these slides or just ask your county extension agent and they can help you locate the appropriate resources um, so some of the other harvests quickly I want to talk about is group selection Election. This can be thought of um, as basically a small opening in the woods. Um, these things may be an 
half an acre to an acre and a half in size. And what we're trying to do with these is get enough sunlight to come down to the ground so that we can get the appropriate species to grow there. Um, so again, it works well with um, our oak trees. Um, what we'll have in a, a situation like this is we may see some of our species that are shade intolerant growing up in the middle of this uh, opening like yellow poplar and then along the edges um, in, the, in the medium area of this opening we'll start seeing our oaks really do well so um, it's a good way to regenerate a diverse um, set of woods. And this is kind of an example from a, another cartoon drawing of it from a side view but basically we're just taking a group of trees and we're taking them all out in that area. Another practice that is sometimes recommended here and done in Kentucky to regenerate our woodlands is called a shelter wood, and it really is what it sounds. So I'll kind of walk you around what we're seeing here. In the upper left-hand corner there labeled number one is a typical wood that we may have here in Kentucky. It has reached a stage where it is ready for a timber harvest, but we're not really getting the a regeneration that we want. We don't, you don't see enough of the smaller trees under there, um, and we may not have the right species that we're interested in again oftentimes that will be oak species that so we're not seeing those so what we may do is we go in there and we'll take a a, a good percentage of those um, larger trees out but we're leaving enough of the trees to get a medium to a large amount of sunlight on the ground to try to stimulate the response of those uh, baby seedlings that are there or new acorns that come on the ground. Um, you know, doing these things um, a couple years after a good harvest or a good acorn crop um, can work well. Once you get a bunch of little baby oaks on the ground, you can kind of free up some sunlight for them. And then, you know, as we get bigger down there in the bottom right hand corner, these trees are starting to grow up. These little seedlings have now grown up and they're starting to get big enough that they can kind of occupy the site um, and then uh, moving into number four there and we got a young stand where we've taken off basically those larger trees and um, now that that's freed up all of these um, smaller trees to kind of fill that growing space and then basically we can repeat this cycle um, down the road as well. So here's kind of a cartoon drawing of it from the side in different stages. So we may start over in the far left there, stage one. And again, we've not got enough of the regeneration of the young trees that we want to have. So we go over to stage two and we'll take out, you know, half or more of the trees in the overstory. And by doing so, we're allowing um, a, a good medium to large amount of sunlight to hit the tree, not full sunlight, because um, they'd probably be overrun run with yellow poplar and some of our intolerant, shade intolerant species um, but a medium amount of lights hitting the ground there and that stimulates the growth of these small seedlings and then once they reach a, a size that they can be successful then we can come in and remove the overstory and um, allow that future generation uh, or future forest to take off and do well. So I want to get into a little bit about the groups that we can work with and help you all manage your woods and care for your woodlands the best. <coughs> excuse me. Um, the first one I want to talk about is the Kentucky Division of Forestry and they will come out and meet with you one-on-one -on -one and discuss your objectives for your property. They can conduct an inventory of your property. They can also help you identify any issues whether it be invasive species or they may identify some trespass or some other things that you may not have been aware of so that in itself is a valuable reference. Um, I mentioned earlier the management plan, this forest stewardship plan that they can develop for you. They can also help you get certified and when we're talking about certification, we're talking about um, third party certification that you are managing your woods in a sustainable manner. Um, you may have seen some of the signs on some packaging um, from the Forest Stewardship Council or the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. If you'll look on some of your packaging of either food or other containers, you'll notice those little emblems um, that say that this wood came from a sustainably managed forest and in order for something to get that label, we have to be able to trace that product all the way back to the woods um, where it came from and ensure that it was being managed sustainably. So the Kentucky Division of Forestry Foresters can help you navigate that process. They can also provide technical assistance showing you which um, practices need to be done and actually showing you how to do some of those practices. Um, they also have some equipment um, available such as um, tree setters if you're doing a tree planting job. They uh, get you access to some cost share programs. They're in the know as far as 
establish what's available for you in your area. And again, it can vary um, depending on what part of the state you're in, which programs are open, and they have different enrollment times and stuff. So instead of trying to cover all of those programs, it's much better to kind of work with the forester, um, let them know what you're trying to accomplish, and then they can try to match you up with the appropriate program. Again, I mentioned the tree seedlings they have available, and then the timber harvest inspections are a big part of what their county rangers do. And of course, um, we owe them all a great deal of gratitude for their wildfire suppression efforts. Um, they just came off a very extensive um, wildfire season, and um, they spend a lot of time and a lot of hours out there trying to protect not only our woods, um, but property and lives that are near those woods as well. So this is a great organization. I encourage you to work um, closely with them as you care for your woodland. They are um, spread out across the state. So this is a map of the different regional offices that you can see there. Um, there are five different regional offices and they also have two um, tree nurseries that grow tree seedlings. These will be smaller seedlings, um, you know, about as big as your um, index finger or so. And um, those are available at a really fair price. Um, so that's a great opportunity. They do have those seedlings available now. Um, so you can get on their website and see what seedlings they have available. They have an order form that you can um, check out. So again, um, I would encourage you if you do not have a stewardship plan, um, jot down the number of the um, office that covers your area where your woodland is located and um, get a hold of them and tell them that you would like to get a stewardship plan for your property. Um, it's a great service and a great opportunity to really get the most out of your woodland. The next group I want to mention is the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Again, they have private lands biologists that can come out much like the forester and meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I believe their program does have a 25 acre minimum, um, but certainly it wouldn't hurt to give them a call if you have some questions or issues. I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you and they may be able to give you some assistance even if you do have a little smaller property than that. On their website, they have over 30 habitat how-tos. These are short um, one to four page documents that talk about different habitat practices, depending on what species or issues you're dealing with. It's a great um, reference, real concise on doing different management practices. And they also have fisheries biologists. So if you have a pond on your property, they can help diagnose issues with that, whether it be weed issues or fish kill issues or others. And they can also help um, get get stocking of that pond as well. Also, if you're having nuisance wildlife issues, that's the group you want to get a hold of. You want to let them know if, certainly if it's an animal that's causing property damage, um, let them know you're having an issue with it. And depending on what you're dealing with, they can um, help navigate you to the appropriate action. They have these private lands biologists spread out across the state. And here is a map, um, a relatively recent map, I believe, of their distribution. Um, again, you can get this off of their website, but I would encourage you to get to know your private lands biologist and work with them. They're all a bunch of great gentlemen and gals that want to work with you and try to help you manage your property um, for wildlife interests. And again, a great thing about woodland management is we can do practices that are both um, friendly for wildlife life as well as timber. So work with these individuals. The, the private lands biologists and the service foresters I mentioned a moment ago, those are the two key folks that as a woodland owner you want to get to know and want to work with. The other group that can certainly do some important practices on your property are master loggers. Um, we have a Kentucky master logger program here in Kentucky, and you can get on and um, check them out, masterlogger.org there. And it's a good opportunity to find people in your area. Um, this program, again, is designed to teach master loggers how to um, harvest in environmentally safe ways, um, but really it's a focus on protecting water quality. Um, you can find loggers in your area, go to that website and you can search by your county and surrounding counties um, to find master loggers in your area. And you will also see what we call bad actors on there. So these are loggers that have gotten in trouble for violating the law. Um, it is pretty difficult to get on that. There's a number of opportunities that not become a bad actor. So generally if that, if if there's a person that is on that bad actor list, we'd recommend you find somebody else to work with um, so you can avoid some problems.
The next group I want to mention is the Center for Forest and Wood Certification that's housed here at the University of Kentucky. Um, I mentioned earlier the certification stuff. Um, and this is a group that can help you navigate that process if you're a woodland owner or if you do have a, a, a wood business of some kind, they can help you deal with that as well. They've got a ton of information and technical assistance, again, not only to landowners, but to forest products companies. So if this is something you're interested in, I encourage you to um, reach out to them and, um, and see how you can work with them. Our sister university in terms of extension is Kentucky State University. They have a number of programs that you may not be aware of. They have expertise in pawpaws and honeybees and aquaculture. This would be um, growing fish or shrimp or prawns or other things in ponds. Um, they also have a number of different small farm programs and they have a a thing they call Third Thursday. So the third Thursday of almost every month, they have an educational workshop at their research farm in Frankfurt. And it's a great opportunity to get a lot of information um, in a short period of time. So I encourage if some of those topics are of interest to you, um, reach out to them and um, they'll be more than happy to help you. Um, if you're not sure really um, about that, talk to your county extension agent and they can give you a little further advice. The other group I want to mention is Kentucky Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, NRCS. They have a lot of assistance that's available to landowners. Again, they're all about conservation of our natural resources, our soil and water and trees even. And a lot of those um, farm bill programs I mentioned before do come through um, their office. So it's a great um, outfit and they do a lot for landowners here in the state. And they also have technical assistance. Um, technicians that can come out and work with you on different issues. Maybe you're having water issues or, um, or, or other types of issues on your property, conservation related, um, reach out to them and they can help. And again, like I said, they mentioned, or they have the cost share programs. Many of them do um, originate from NRCS. So those vary um, depending on where you're at in the state and um, what you're trying to do. The other group I want to mention quickly is the Kentucky Association of Consulting Foresters. These are private business folks that um, work on your behalf. They do work on a commission basis, but they do timber sales and marketing. They can also give you timber cruises and appraisals. So if you just wanted to know um, what you had or if you had something of value or if you wanted some estimate of the value, they're capable of doing that. Um, unfortunately, the Kentucky Division of Foresters, uh, Division of Forestry Service Foresters are not allowed to give you those types of estimates. Um, and, and, and honestly, they're probably better coming from consultant foresters because they do work with it on a daily basis. It's not that the Kentucky Division of Forestry foresters don't understand or know what their woods are worth, um, but they also work with loggers and the wood industry and it just puts them in a bad spot. So if you needed to know how much your timber was worth, um, this would be the group you'd want to work with. They also deal with issues of timber trespass and they do timber management as well. Um, Kentucky Tree Farm Committee is a another group that I'm a member of and an, we have a bunch of different organizations represented there and it's really all about promoting good forest management. It is a program that if you've done some practices on your property, you have a management plan and you've um, been implementing some of those um, prop, or practices, then it makes you eligible to um, become part of this and it gets you a nice sign that you can put on your property, um, but it also gets you some good assistance to help manage your property. We do a number of different recognition programs throughout the year. Um, we recognize a tree farmer each year in Kentucky, the Kentucky Tree Farmer of the Year. We also recognize a logger of the year, and we have tree farm inspectors that do these inspections of tree farmers, and many of those are actually the foresters with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. So um, working with them can get you into this program as well. Another group I would encourage you to get involved with if you are a woodland owner is the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association. This is a nonprofit membership based organization um, specifically for Kentucky woodland owners and it's controlled um, exclusively by Kentucky woodland owners. Uh, it's a great group of um, women and men that work on behalf of woodland owners and they do a lot of things on your behalf whether you realize it or not. So I would encourage you to get involved with this and support this group and, and get engaged because they do have a number of different programs um, that you'll find of use. So please um, get involved with this group because really they are working for you. So help them help you. To summarize this presentation, I want to go over the keys to caring for your woodland. There's a number of things that I think will be important as you go about trying to get the most out of your woodlands. 
one of the first things I would encourage you to do is try to engage family members. It's maybe a son or a daughter, a cousin, niece or nephew, somebody that's going to be around to understand what you've been trying to accomplish on your woodland and has some experience on that. The more invested they are in the property, the more likely they are to continue the management practices that you've been implementing. It's important to determine and understand what you own. As we discussed earlier, there's a variety of options to understand what you have on your property and the professionals through the Kentucky Division of Forestry as well as Fish and Wildlife are available to help you manage your property. And once you've got an inventory of your property and you've thought about your objectives, then it's an opportunity for you to realistically decide what you want from your woodlands. We may have all kinds of dreams for what we want out of our woodlands, but if they're not realistic, it's going to end in a lot of frustration. So matching that inventory up with um, your knowledge of what you have um, and what you want to accomplish will allow you to be realistic in setting your objectives. And then once you've got your objectives in place, you really want to learn what you can do to achieve those objectives. I mentioned before, we have professionals out there. The Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources have wildlife biologists that will work with you on wildlife practices. The Kentucky Division of Forestry has service foresters that will work with you on woodland management practices. So working with these professionals is critical to ensure that you achieve your objectives as quickly and as efficiently as possible. They're a great resource, so please work with these individuals. And of course, whenever we uh, try to do different things on our property, some things will maybe be more successful than others. So we want to try to learn and evaluate our successes and learn from any failures that we have so that we don't have to repeat them in the future. And finally, I would suggest that we want to try to protect against any of our woodland threats whether it's invasive species such as the emerald ash borer, or if you're dealing with wildfire or timber theft, any of these things can be mitigated through some good management practices. So working with your professionals will ensure that you're doing the right things on your property to ensure that your woodlands are um, as healthy and as productive as possible. So those are some of the keys for protecting your woodlands. Um, I will go ahead and wrap this presentation up right now. Um, thanks, Renee, for bringing us back to the studio. So this presentation's covered caring for your woodlands. I would encourage you to visit our website at www.ukforestry.org. We have this webinar will be recorded there, as well as a wide variety of other references and resources that are available to you. So please take advantage of those um, and check them out and um, visit us there. You can also send me an email at billy.thomas at uky.edu, and I'd be happy to address any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, and we'll see you later.